Well, hello there. My name is uh, Dr. Patrick Sikorsky. Dr. Sikorsky, can you tell us what your occupation is? Yeah, you betcha. So for about five years now, I've been happily serving as a director of the Criminalistics Lab for the Midlands Department of Criminal Investigation. On the side, I also teach uh, undergraduate and graduate courses over at Midland State University in the science of DNA analysis. What does that job as a director entail? Well, as director, you know, I like to think of myself as the guy that oversees any and all investigations that have got anything to do with physical evidence or forensic science. So, you know, things like DNA evidence and uh, fingerprints and <coughs> uh, So, to that end, I, of course, look at all the latest research in forensic science and uh, do some research of my own through 28 peer-reviewed papers so far. What type of research do you do? Well, most of my research focuses on finding new efficient ways of analyzing any type of DNA or physical evidence that comes up at a crime scene. But I also think that it's real important that what I'm saying is, you know, accessible to the average Joe. So a whole bunch of what I do makes sure that uh, the research I'm doing is accessible to a non-scientific audience. I'd like to direct your attention to the case at hand today. How did you become involved? Well, you know, this whole thing started when I was working in my lab one day, and I get handed over a, a briefcase. In fact, a real important briefcase, the very same one that uh, Mr. Chase Covington had on him at the time of his arrest. What did you end up doing with that briefcase? Well, I did what any forensic scientist does. When I get handed an object, I look over it for all the telltale signs of physical evidence. In that case, that ended up being a fingerprint test, a hair follicle analysis, and a chemical comparison test as well. I want to go through all three of those tests today, but let's start with that first test, the fingerprint analysis. Why did you conduct that test? Well, you know, for us forensic scientists, uh, fingerprints are a, a real home run for a couple of reasons. So one of those is that they're permanent. And what I mean by that is when someone's born, their fingerprints are going to say just the same all the way until death. And the other real important thing about them is that they're unique, which I mean, what I mean by that is that no two per people have the same uh, fingerprint, so that when you find a fingerprint on a certain object, you can pinpoint it to one person and one person only. So how do you conduct a fingerprint analysis test? Well, we start by taking a, a real special magnetic powder and we spread it all around the interior and the exterior of the object. In this case, of course, that briefcase over there. Uh, and we use this, we spread it around using a, a special uh, brush. What did you find once you did that? Well, when I did this uh, initial spreading of the powder, I found six usable fingerprints right there. Would it help if you used the briefcase to show us where you found those fingerprints? Oh, yeah, that would be real nice. Permission to approach the witness with stage one. Granted. There you go. Now, please show us where you found those fingerprints. So when I did my test, I found... Judge, uh, Your Honor. This evidence is contaminated, and he's going to explain the fingerprints that are on it. But at least two of their attorneys, and now three of their witnesses, have touched it with their hands and no gloves. Your Honor, can I respond? Okay. Uh, Dr. Skorsky is just using the briefcase at this point, after he did the analysis uh, months beforehand, to show us where those fingerprints actually were, it's to demonstrate where he found those at that point in time. Overrule the objection. Dr. Sorcey, can you show us where you found those fingerprints? Right, so when I did this uh, initial spreading of the powder, I found, like I said, six fingerprints on this briefcase. So to run through them for you, I found three fingerprints on the handle, right here, here, and here. I found two additional fingerprints on the edge of the briefcase, right here, and right here. And then I found one final fingerprint on uh, this right hand unlocking mechanism, right here. Now, were you able to do any further tests from those fingerprints, with those fingerprints? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not enough that we see these fingerprints. We, of course, you know, got to compare them to something. So, in this case, I, of course, compared them to the known fingerprints of Miss Avery Bancroft and Mr. Chase Covington. And what did those comparisons reveal? Well, when I ran this comparison test, I found that all six of these fingerprints were a match with either uh, Avery Bancroft or Chase Covington. And through that information, what did you conclude? Well, so because I found Avery Bancroft's fingerprints on this briefcase, I knew that at some point in time, Avery Bancroft must have had significant contact with this briefcase. Thank you. Permission to retrieve stage one. Granted. Now, Dr. Skorsky, I 
like to direct your attention to the second test that you mentioned. Can you explain what that hair analysis test was? Yeah, you betcha. So conceptually, it's, it's real simple here. So when we find hair you know, on an object, we can be sure that whoever's hair that is must have had some kind of physical contact with the object. In this case, when I opened up this briefcase, I found five hairs right in that briefcase. So I knew that I had to you know, find out whose hairs these were. And how did you conduct that test? So it's a two-prime test here. The first part of it we call light microscopy, and the second part of it we call mitochondrial DNA profiling, or we can just call it mtDNA profiling for short. Can you explain what light microscopy is? Yeah, so light microscopy is a, a real preliminary, a non-scientific test where you just essentially take a microscope and look at two objects and make sure that they at least bear you know, some kind of semblance to one another so that you can do some further scientific analysis to see if those two objects are a match. And what about mtDNA profiling? What's that? mtDNA <coughs> profiling is where the real science comes into play to determine a match between two objects. So to break it down for you word by word, mitochondrial refers to the mitochondrion of the human cell, which is what gives you all your energy. And DNA, as you probably know, is what makes you you. So when you put those together, you get DNA found in the mitochondrion. Now, hairs are real ideal because they have all sorts of mitochondrion on them. So we take those hairs, we take the mitochondria from those hairs, we take the DNA from those mitochondria, and then we simply compare those with the DNA of the known suspects. And what were the results of that test? Well, when I took these five hairs, you know, I ran them through this uh, light microscopy test, first of all, and I found that they were you know, human hairs and bear some kind of semblance to those of Avery Bancroft. So I knew it was worth further analysis. And then I did the mtDNA profiling test, and I found that, sure enough, they were a genetic match with the, the hairs of Avery Bancroft. And what did that make you conclude? Well, I mean, we got to think about this for a second. These were Avery Bancroft's hairs, and they were inside that briefcase. So that means that in some point in time, Avery Bancroft must have been near this open briefcase in order for her hairs to be in the thing. <coughs> There was a third test that you mentioned, the chemical comparison. Why did you take that test? Well, you know, when I got this briefcase, like I said earlier, one of the first things I did was open it up, and right there in front of me, I see this, this huge stain about an inch, an inch in diameter and, and real fragrant. I mean, oofta, this thing smelled. So, you know, I knew that I had to investigate. This was a, a real significant part of the object, and I had to investigate it because that's what we do as forensic scientists. So how did you investigate it? Well, I used another two-prime test, and this one uh, we, it's called uh, the Gas Chromatography Mass Spectrometry Test, or GCMS for short. Can you explain what gas chromatography is? Yeah, so gas chromatography starts with a glass cylinder filled with helium gas, which as you, you might know from ever seeing helium balloons, causes objects to rise. So when you put different substances into this cylinder, they're going to rise to the top of that cylinder. Now, because every substance is chemically different, they rise at different rates. But if you get two different substances, you put them in the cylinder, and you watch them rise to the top of that cylinder at the very same rate, then that's an indicator right there that they may be the same substance. Now, you also mentioned mass spectrometry. What's that? Mass spectrometry, to put it you know, real nice and simple for you, is simply taking different substances, picking them apart <coughs> by the components that make them up, in this case, ions, and then weigh in those ions. So if you take two different substances and you find that the ions of each substance <coughs> weigh about the same, then that's another indicator that they may be the, substance, the same substance. So if you find that two substances pass the GC test and the MS test, that's certainty right there, that they're the same substance. Did they pass those tests? Yeah, in this case, that fragrance stain uh, passed the same test that uh, a fancy French perfume of Avery Bancroft's passed, La Nuit Guarahe. So they were a match. After taking all three of these tests, what conclusions were you able to come to? So, taking all these tests together, we can be sure that Avery Bancroft had significant contact with that briefcase prior to Chase Covington's arrest. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you very much.